Hey everyone, this is Cobain the Christian. Today what I want to do is I want to talk about the curious ways in which contemporary natural science has undergirded and underscored particular aspects of the Christian interpretation of the world in ways than categories that we don't often think about in the larger discussion of Christianity and its relationship to the natural sciences. Before we get into the nitty gritty of that, I do want to mention my Patreon. Now I've divided my Patreon into three tiers. There's the donation tier, which is five to ten dollars. There's the premium tier, which is ten to twenty dollars. And then there's the elite tier, which is twenty dollars and up. Now at the moment, the uh, access to premium benefits only holds true for the $10 and up. And I've created this three-tier system because if I want to add super premium benefits in the future, I don't want to make it difficult for people to retroactively move themselves into those into that tier if they've already, say, contributed $20 plus per month. As I've kept saying, uh, I'm going to have a video talking specifically about these housekeeping issues. And I do want to mention that you can also do a custom donation. For example, if you just want to give $1 a month, that's totally fine. That's totally cool. Uh, you can do a custom amount on Patreon. Or if you want to get into the premium tier, but you want to give $11 instead of $10, you can also do that. So I'm getting used to this system. Uh, I'm new to Patreon and, and engaging with it at this level. So please do be patient with me. And of course, if you're just a viewer, if you're not interested or financially able in making a monthly contribution, that is totally cool. I really can't emphasize how much I appreciate everybody who views and engages with these videos. Uh, it's a, it's a very fun and fulfilling process for me, and I hope uh, you get a little taste of that as you listen to these podcasts and so on and so forth. So the premium content, the premium benefit, which will be included, are access to live stream Q&A sessions or, and or, um, uh, guaranteed, you know, answers to pre-written questions in a Q&A video, which will be available only to premium subscribers, as well as guaranteed complete access to all videos and podcasts in full, which means if I make a two-hour interview with a particular scholar uh, and only upload one hour to general consumption, uh, everybody who has contributed $10 and up will have access to the complete interview. So more on that as we go forward in the future. But with all of that said, I want to get into the question of the relationship of Christianity and biblical theology to the natural sciences in ways which are not often discussed under this category. Now, when you hear somebody saying that they want to discuss Christianity and science or Christian theology and the sciences, what is the relationship between the two? Usually they're going to be talking about one of two categories. Number Number one, they can be talking. They can talk about the history of Christianity and its relationship to the development of science as a method of investigation, or they can be talking about the empirical compatibility of particular traditional views of the world with the scientific evidence. So obviously, the most um, popular, the most controversial issue under that second heading would be things like the age of the Earth, the global flood. Uh, the theory of evolution and Christianity. And those who have followed me for a while know that this has a very special significance for me because of where I started up and where I've ended up. But I don't want to talk about that today. Uh, and, and also you can talk, people will talk about geocentrism, um, uh, whether that's an empirical conflict that the traditional view, Christian view of the world has with the sciences and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then people can talk about whether Christianity played an instrumental role in facilitating the development of science as a method of investigation. So the kind of the TLDR uh, way of thinking about this would be to say that science is a method of empirical investigation is something which is really a, a post-Newtonian and a post-Renaissance development. So that before that, people would talk about the concrete details of the world in terms of their relationship to first principles. So a circle is a perfect, uh, is the kind of geometric image of perfection, thus the planets have perfectly circular orbits. Uh, then there's a shift at some point in the late Middle Ages towards a more empirical focus on the world with, from which we get the natural sciences. Now, as with anything that takes that short amount of time to explain, it's going to be an oversimplification, but there's an element of truth to it. And the question that people want to talk about under this heading 
is whether Christianity and the Christian interpretation of the world writ large played a role in bringing about this change, uh, this new focus on the significance of empirical data in constructing a holistic interpretation of the world. Now, both of those categories contain a host of important questions, questions which we are going to be dealing with as we continue to talk about these issues, uh, as we continue to talk about Christianity, the truth of the Christian faith, the structure and content of the Christian interpretation of the world. We'll be talking about these issues and related questions. But what I want to talk about today does not fit into either of these categories. Rather, it has to do with whether or not contemporary scientific and empirical study of the world has anything to say about the traditional grammar through which the world is interpreted. Now, a few days ago, I uploaded a video slash podcast about the biblical grammar of creation, thinking in biblical terms. And what I suggested to you was that the biblical grammar by which we understand reality has, uh, does not merely have to do with particular affirmations about God and the world. It doesn't particularly, it doesn't only concern things like the incarnation as a statement of fact. It doesn't only concern things like the Trinity as a statement of fact. And it doesn't just include particular symbolic affirmations about the world, though it includes all of these things. So we say that the world is intrinsically symbolic, meaning part of a created thing's nature, part of its inner reason for existing, part of what makes it what it is, is the reality that it signifies something about God. So the sun, S-U-N, that star that you see in the sky every day, objectively signifies the reign of Jesus Christ over the world. Jesus is the sun of righteousness who rises with healing in his wings. The sun is said to rule the day and the moon is said to rule the night. The sun objectively has this symbolic relationship with notions of rain and sovereignty and life-giving. So why, if you look around the world, note how pervasive celestial imagery is in the symbolism of certain nations. Why do so many flags have sun, moon, and stars on it? It's because of this aspect of the creation design, which was given by revelation to Adam, to Noah, and so forth, and thus transmitted as part of the interpretive grid by which all the nations saw the world. But it's not just this. Rather, the essence of a biblical and symbolic grammar in interpreting the creation is about the particular relationships which one concept has with another, or which a group of concepts share with another. So the example that I gave the other day was about the relationship between, let's say, trees and ladders or towers to heaven. Why is it that in the transmission of the tradition of the event of the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babylon, why is it that so many cultures altered the historical reality of the tower to the reality or the tradition of a cosmic tree. Why is it that when uh, the central, and I think the source of this tradition as a historical narrative, uh, why is it that when Josephus describes a great gust of wind blowing over this architectural structure overnight, leading to people waking up and realizing they can't understand each other, why is it that in the Abor Australian Aboriginal form of this tradition, it is a great gust of wind which blows the cosmic tree and shakes the world's languages out of it. That's very interesting, by the way, that we have these extra biblical details about the tradition of the Tower of Babel, which appear in various world, uh, various aspects of world mythology. A tower, a sacred tower, a temple, and a tree are not intuitively connected to the modern mind. One doesn't necessarily remind you of the other. So why is it that they seem to be so connected in the transmission of this tradition? Well, it's because a temple, a sanctuary, is a ladder to heaven. It is an architectural holy mountain which leads the people who go ascend it up to communion with the heavenly council, with the heavenly court. It facilitates commerce between the gods and between the children 
of men. And a tree signifies, among other things, the very same idea. This is why there is so much symbolism among the cultures of the world and in the Bible of sacred trees. Why does Abraham construct altars at sacred trees? Why are trees associated with particular revelations of God to man? Why is it, after all, that the central symbol of Christianity is the cross, the tree on which Jesus Christ was lifted up, opening up the gateway to heaven? Well, it's because these two apparently separate concepts signify the same reality, uh, there's a link which connects these apparently different nests and webs of concepts. So when we talk about the grammar by which we understand the creation, we're not just talking about particular affirmations like the existence of God, the incarnation of the Son, uh, the subsistence of one God in three persons nor are we merely talking about particular symbolic truths. We're not merely talking about the fact that a tree signifies the cross and you know, vice versa. Rather, we are talking about the way in which all of these concepts are connected together into a single unified grid by which we make the world intelligible as a revelation of God, the Logos, God, the Word. All things exist in view of their unique mode of participation in God's creative acts, his creative energies. Since the Father always acts in the Son, and through the Son, the Son is called the Logos of God, and the Son, the Logos, by the Holy Spirit, by his revelation through the Holy Spirit, uh, makes the world known to us. We make all things intelligible in and through him. And Christianity, when understood rightly, is a very satisfying, at least for me, uh, way of making sense of the world writ large, both in terms of the overarching you know, arc of history, in terms of its visual details, in terms of the intelligibility of beauty, uh, and in terms of its particular historical claims about like the resurrection of Jesus and so on and so forth. So what I want to talk to you about today is the way in which these connections, these, uh, uh, this grammatical structure relates to contemporary scientific study of things like the human body. And I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take for me to go into this, um, but I want to focus on one uh, quality in particular, and that is the notion of blood and the biblical understanding of blood as the conduit for life. Uh, and I also want to connect that if I have the time and energy to the structure of trees and the relationship that trees have with human beings. Because it's very interesting that we see the same structure appearing in the world generated by a very apparently different physical processes. So, for example, you have the structure of an atom. You have a nucleus, and then you have concentric circles around which the electrons, I believe, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the electrons whirl. I think you have protons at the center, and then you have the electrons revolving in concentric circles. So you have that particular structure where there's uh, a, a center, and then there are particles revolving around that center. When you go up to the macro level in the cosmos, you find very similarly, you have a star and then you have concentric circles of planets revolving around that star. Or you can take a planet and then you have concentric circles of moons revolving around that planet. Or you could take a whole galaxy and you could see the sphere or the, um, uh, the swirling structure of the galaxy as a uh, way of distributing matter across very large scales. And you can even go up a level from that and look at supergalactic clusters. Uh, all the way down from supergalactic clusters down to the bottom form of the atom seem to be structured according to the same aesthetic design. But particularly when we compare the atom and the structure of, you know, uh, celestial matter. Uh, these are very different sets of physical laws which explain why matter is structured in this particular way. So the fact that you have the same archetype structuring uh, matter in two very different ways 
suggests that the design writ large is part of the actual nature of the thing. That it's not just little bits of matter in motion, then we can get down to the very bottom and that'll explain everything. It's not just a reductionist view of the world, but the holistic structure of the world is part of its inner purpose, its inner reason, part of the divine intention. And when we see that, the fact that an archetype appears to have uh, a presence in the material world other than just the very bottom, um, it suggests to us that we should look to the nature of that archetype when we ask the question, you know, what is the purpose of a thing? And we see this very same principle in the structure of a biological organism like a human being and the structure of a organism like a tree. Now think for a moment about the way that blood works in human beings. And we're about to get into more detail with this, but I just want to give you a summary statement. What is blood fundamentally doing in the human body? Blood is communicating oxygen from a central position all the way out to the extremities of the body, facilitating the distribution of energy to the whole body so that the body can act as a unified organism, so that motion can occur all the way to your, the tips of your fingers and all the way to the tips of your toes. That requires oxygen, and the oxygen is pumped from that central location uh, governed by the heart and then the lungs on either side of the heart, uh, and it allows for movement. Not only does it allow for movement, but it allows for a cohesive, unified movement where the whole body acts with respect to particular uh, distinct goals. Now think about the way a tree is structured. In addition to the, just the upright structure of the tree, which makes a special analogy to the human being, which is why trees in the scriptures are very frequently connected with human beings as kind of a, uh, a, an interpretive grid. So, you know, the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water that bear their fruit in season. Jesus said, a good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. But the tree also has an analogous uh, process by which it communicates energy throughout the whole. And that's sap. Uh, sap is essentially the blood of the tree. Sap contains a concentration of energy. You know, it tastes sweet, it's sugary because there's a high concentration of energy. And it's distributed throughout the whole communicating energy to the whole and allowing the whole organism to live. Now, of course, there are going to be differences between the role of sap in the tree and the role of blood in a, uh, an animal. Uh, but the base similarity is very interesting just given how different they are at the kind of biological uh, and genetic level. Or we can consider the role that honey plays in a beehive. Now, you might be familiar with a video which went viral, I think it was a few months ago, and that was a beekeeper who described the process by which he decided to destroy one of his hives, the steps that he took to try to avert that final catastrophe. But the bees kept acting as killer bees. You know, a killer bee is a particular sort of bee which seems to come from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and it's a it manifests in a particular behavioral pattern, which is very, very aggressive. So a good beekeeper, if he's working with normal honeybees, is not going to have bees which are always attacking him, which are attacking, you know, nearby residents. They'll be relatively peaceful. Uh, but this killer bee uh, is very, very aggressive. You cannot work with a hive of killer bees to produce honey in a stable and peaceful way. It's going to harass those around the area, and it's going to harass the one who is trying to take care of the beehive to begin with. Whereas if you have the traditional honeybee, they will get to know the beekeeper, and they won't attack him because they'll know that he intends their good. And I thought it was just so fascinating how he went through everything that he tried to do to avoid destroying the hive, how he would try to requeen it multiple times. He would change its leadership, as it were. He tried to change its behavior in all sorts of ways, and each failed. And so at the end, with great sorrow, because, you know, you develop a relationship with these hives, with, with great sorrow, he decided to destroy the hive as a whole. 
And it just struck me how this was a parable of God's relationship with particular nations or with particular individuals. God is the divine beekeeper who wants to draw honey out of the human family to produce a, uh, a structure which generates glory and which reflects his own glory through the activity of the Holy Spirit. We even see the connection of honey to divine glory and to the Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures. Just look at uh, where the honey is analogous to the word of God, which is analogous to things like gold, which shines with divine splendor. Uh, and God will do everything he can to avoid the eventuality of destroying a particular human hive, as it were. But at the end of the day, some may rebel against him with such ferocity that there is no other way to protect the creation in which this hive li lives other than dis the destruction of a particular human hive. And that can be a an individual, that can be a subculture, that can be a nation, that can be you know the whole world as occurred in the flood of Noah. Uh, but we see that honey plays an analogous role to both sap in the tree and blood in individual biological organisms. Honey is sweet for the very same underlying reason that sap is sweet, because it contains a concentration of energy which allows for the bees in this hive cluster to draw energy over the long term. And so here we see the analogy between an individual body, as blood plays a role in the individual biological organism, there is an analogy between the individual body where, which is unified in its activity or animated by blood uh, and a collection of organisms or a society. So think about the way that the word body is used in the scriptures and elsewhere. Body can refer to our kind of physical structure, but it can also refer to a body politic. It can refer to the body of Christ. Body signifies both the structure of the individual organism where the parts are unified in light of an uh, overarching whole, and it can refer to a whole society, which is unified by an analogous uh, metaphysical or, or living principle. So it's very interesting how we see uh, this analogy between the individual body and the social body in the natural world, as well as in other respects, which we'll get into. But I want to talk specifically about blood right now. Now, what does blood do? As we've just described, blood, its function is the transmission of oxygen all across the human body. And we have the cardiovascular system because the uh, system which has its center in the human heart and the system which has its center in the lungs are intimately interconnected. They're connected so intimately that they're really inextricable from one another. They're two aspects of one system. And you can see, just think about it on a visual level. That's the first kind of uh, step in understanding biblical and Christian symbolism. Two things look similar very often because they are two manifestations of a single archetype. You have the mercy seat in the tabernacle, and on either side you have the two uh, cherubim. And those cherubim signify the divine or the heavenly council, which is given its structure by the Holy Spirit as the glory cloud of God. The Holy Spirit creates an environment which uh, facilitates the generation of the society of many different persons, various angels and archangels, and then of course at the center Jesus Christ enthroned as God. Uh, the human heart and the lung on either side and the lungs on either side, you know, has a kind of basic visual similarity to this. And there's a reason for this. The heart is consistently described in the scriptures as the throne of the Lord in terms of God's dwelling in man. The Holy Spirit is sent into our heart. The Holy of Holies in the scriptures is described as the heart in some places of the tabernacle and the temple, in some places uh, of, of Israel as a nature, as a nation rather. Uh, the Holy of Holies is the beating heart of the children of Israel. It's the beating heart of the church in terms of God's dwelling with mankind. And the Eucharist is clearly and consistently associated with the heart. Remember, remember in your hearts, that's a very common refrain as you look through the scriptures. Well, the Eucharist is the offering of remembrance. 
And when the priest brings the Eucharist to the altar in the divine liturgy, uh, what does he say? Remember, O Lord. Then he commemorates the names of the living. Then he commemorates the names of the dead. So there's this network of liturgical analogies which makes this uh, principle intelligible. Well, and then remember how I said the spirit creates the environment in which the heavenly council exists. So just remember that throughout the scriptures, you have this glory cloud environment. And when a prophet enters into the glory cloud, he sees the divine council in session. It creates an environment within which there exists a communion of persons created, the angels, the archangels, and now human saints, and uncreated, the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity. Well, the Holy Spirit is obviously associated with the notion of wind, of breath, or of air. And so, what is on either side of the human holy of holies? Well, the two lungs, which are breathing air in and out of the body. So there's a real analogy here which makes sense at several levels. But, but let's keep talking about this. Let's see if these threads hold true um, as we pursue these concepts even more deeply. So I mentioned that the spirit is associated with breath. Okay, this is uh, perfectly obvious to the, the point of self-evidence, just at the kind of linguistic or etymological level. Uh, in the Hebrew language, you have the ruach, which means in some contexts spirit as in the personal spirit. In another context, it means, you know, wind or breath. Uh, you have in Genesis 2, uh, 2, 7, the breath of life, which is given from God to the dust of the ground, and it animates the human being as the newly created image and likeness of God. You have in the account of the creation of the world, the spirit of God hovers over the surface of the waters on the first creation day. And that matches in terms of the literary structure of the Pentateuch to the description in Deuteronomy 32 of the glory cloud of God, the God of Israel hovering over Israel as a people. And the same word is in fact used and it's not a common word. And the fact that it occurs at the beginning and the end of the Pentateuch of the Torah uh, suggests that there's a literary relationship between the two. So this is one way that we actually know that we're not just dealing with the wind swept across the face of the waters. Uh, of course, it's intimately related to this idea of wind, but it includes this idea of divine presence. You have that on happening on the first creation day. And then in the story of the flood, beginning in Genesis 8, you have a wind which blows over the surface of the water and signifies the recreation of the world. And so you can follow out the structure of Genesis chapter 8 um, uh, to see how it follows day by day the order of events in the creation week as God is giving the world a new birth. And note again, it says God remembered Noah. And it's in that context that we have a wind sweeping over the face of the waters. And then again in Genesis 9, we have a covenant by which God remembers Noah and we have a rainbow, which shows the divine splendor in the clouds. And we can see the rainbow as an aspect of the glory cloud in Ezekiel chapter 1 and elsewhere. So we have a lot of these uh, texts mutually reinforcing this network of connections. Now, what is it about the spirit of God that uh, links it with the idea of wind or of breath? And what is it about breath that links it with the idea of life? Well, I think we've discussed this uh, in a few other videos, but the basic kind of conceptual core to the notion of life as a quality is the idea of motion. So in my video on a biblical and Christian grammar of the world, I described how because the qualities of God, even though they're infinitely various, they're indivisibly one, because that's true, it's also true in the creation, that there's something of everything in everything else. Now that doesn't mean that everything is alive. What it does mean is that there's something analogous to life in everything in creation. So the fancy word for this is analogical predication, which is contrasted with univocal predication. Univocal means in the same sense, analogical means in an analogical sense. While everything is not necessarily alive, there is an analogy to life in everything. Why? Because everything that exists, exists through some kind of motion. Even things that we imagine to be perfectly still. The word still or motionless has the particular conceptual context, but it's not true in this bottom level metaphysical sense. If you have a rock which is sitting still, let's say the rock is gray in color, 
it is moving in the sense that, on account of its being what it is, it is making its color manifest in relation to those creatures with the capacity for sight. And so you can see the, you know, movement of light is coming from one direction and it's moving outwards in all direction and then it is apprehended and embraced by those creatures with the answering capacity or power of seeing. So there's a double motion that's going on here. There's a mutual indwelling. If you're seeing, you're extending yourself outwards via sight in the direction you're looking and everything that is visible has the quality of being able to be seen is extending itself outwards in all directions and there's that embrace which creates the actual experience or qualitative experience of sight the fancy word for that being qualia that idea of qualitative experience which is irreducible to anything else so there's this idea of motion which permeates all things anything which exists has to have motion in some way or another. And that's rooted in the infinitely swift motion in which God exists. The Father is always extending himself outwards towards the Son, and he's doing so so fast that his motion to embrace the Son is simultaneous with the Son's motion to receive the Father's embrace and reciprocate it by the Holy Spirit who mediates between the two in this energetic sense. This is what an energetic procession actually means. And we see then that eternity is not the opposite of time, but it's the fulfillment of time. You know, eternity means that the gap between motion towards and receptive motion and motion in response is nil. There's no gap between them. They are simultaneous, even as there is that structure of relationship. So an analogy here would be like a river. Uh, the, there's still a structure of relationship even as that structure is not temporally defined. A river exists with a source from which it bubbles up. And that source is at every moment giving rise to the river, even though the source doesn't exist in one moment and then the river exists in the next moment. The river exists all at once with both the source and the body. So motion is the basic principle by which things exist. And a living being, as a living being, not just something that has an analogy to life, but with something which is actually alive, in biblical terms, that is an organism with blood. So I think plants are the most closely analogous to living beings in the biblical sense. But if we're talking in biblical categories, strictly speaking, plants are not alive in that complete sense. But I think what sets living organisms with blood apart from everything else in the creation is that they constitute kind of a principle of motion in and of themselves. So a dog is moving in all directions that is in ways that are not just governed by the context in which the dog exists. So let's just say a wolf exists in the wild. The wolf's movement is not determined by the structure of the ground and the ground's relationship to the sun, etc., etc. The wolf is moving in a direction whose explanation requires reference to the inner principle of the wolf itself. A uh, human being moves in directions and acts in ways that requires explanation in terms of a power of activity proper to and having its source in the human being itself or him or herself. Don't want to use impersonal terms for persons, I think. Um, I think that's what sets a living being apart as a living being. And so this is what blood is all about. Blood facilitates the communication of life to the whole body from the crown of your head to the sole of your foot, as Isaiah would put it. Blood is what permits the existence of creatures who have this kind of principle of motion contained within their own natures, which of course are given at every moment by God. So let's think about that in terms of the biblical theology of blood. Obviously, the first text that we would want to go to is in Leviticus chapter 17. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And this has a very important significance in terms of the tabernacle as a whole. Uh, every covenant in scripture is associated with a particular sanctuary. And the Mosaic covenant is associated with the tabernacle. Uh, the 
a Davidic covenant is associated with the tabernacle of David. Uh, the new covenant is, of course, associated with the church, uh, and so on and so forth. But the, uh, uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood doesn't just come as kind of like a random statement. Um, it has a significance in light of what's being talked about sacrificially. And I think we'll get into that um, in, this, in this very video. Um, but blood in scripture is intimately associated with life. So it's remarkable that modern scientific study of the human body has actually revealed that blood is the crucial substance in transmitting oxygen to the whole body. Oxygen, of course, you know, is intimately associated with, and in some contexts we could say it's conceptually identified with air or breath. Breath is actually the same word in uh, the Hebrew language and in the Greek language used to, uh, with, used to refer to the spirit of God. So breath and the spirit of God, the air, the wind, all of these concepts sometimes are signified by the very same word. And what carries breath, what carries wind out from the world and into the human body, enabling the human body to be windy itself, enabling the human body to move through the creation as wind moves things through the creation? Well, it's actually the blood. The blood is the principle and the means by which things are able to move. So we want to get rid of the idea of you know, dualism as necessarily meaning Cartesian dualism. So the traditional Christian approach to the body uh, would have a lot more in common with the hylomorphic account of the soul-body relation than it would with the Cartesian, meaning that kind of the structure, spatially speaking, the actual form of the body is intrinsic to the soul. The soul is the unifying principle by which the body is made alive as a single organism. The body is constituted by many, many different parts, and you can you know, split it down to the smallest level. Ultimately, you're going to get down to basic atoms and subatomic particles. But the body has its own integral existence by which we can identify it as a single thing. You know, it is one body, one kind of thing, and it is unified by the soul as its animating principle, which makes it what it is. What happens when a person dies, what is the difference ontologically, uh, the moment before death and the moment after death, it's that that unifying principle ceases to exist and subsist in the body. So what happens? People fall apart. If the uh, and Except in the case of incorruption, and I think there's a reason for that, except in the case of incorruption, people fall apart because the connection by which the soul is joined to the body as an animating and unifying principle is ruptured. It is severed. Uh, death in scriptural terms is division, and the division of the soul from the body means that the body begins to fall apart. Its unifying, uh, unifying principle has been lost. Now, I think in terms of Christ and his body, the reason his body doesn't see corruption is because the Logos remains incarnate as a human being after the crucifixion. And because the Logos communicates his human operations to every corner of the cosmos, even after his crucifixion, and because the Logos in his humanity is intrinsically bound with the very structure and form of his body, that quality, that operation, which formed his body as a unifying principle, continues to be present in his body while it's in the tomb on Holy Saturday. As such, his body does not lose its structure, it does not lose its form. And I think the communication of the graces of the Incarnation to the people of God through the Holy Spirit explains why certain saints, though not all saints, certain saints have incorrupt bodies, which makes it more than a corpse, or actually makes it not a corpse, it's relics. A relic is not the same thing as a corpse. Now, corpse signifies a particular sort of relation to the pre-death person. Uh, relic signifies a different relationship to the pre-death person. I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of this because it's not the main purpose of the video and I'd have to make all sorts of qualifications to avoid saying something gravely wrong. So uh, blood permits the soul to be what it is as the unifying principle of the body. It gives it its structure and it allows motion to exist distributed throughout the whole thing. It allows energy to be distributed throughout the whole structure. 
Uh, Matt, take what happens when you, uh, let's just say you, you take a, a dumbbell and you put it at the center of your left arm. What's going to happen? You're going to start to lose feeling at the portion of your left arm which exists lower than the dumbbell. You're cutting off, not completely, but to a degree, you're cutting off circulation. Circulation is the way in which the power of activity is transmitted from the creation, from the air, into your body, and ultimately into actual concrete activity. You cut off circulation, you're going to start to lose feeling and you're going to start to lose the ability to actually move your fingers. It's going to be more difficult to move your fingers. So we see here the two aspects of what activity, energy, and energia actually does. The capacity to relate to the world in sensible qualities is itself an energy. So we've talked about this a little earlier in this video, right? Uh, a bluebird, which you're seeing, is seen in a kind of two-way mutual embrace here. The bluebird is manifesting outwardly uh, in a blue quality in relation to those things with the capacity or the power of seeing blue. And seeing is an extension of oneself out towards things which can be seen. So there's a meeting, there's an embrace, and that's where the activity actually happens concretely. By the same token, the reason that cutting off circulation removes or weakens your capacity to actually feel things qualitatively is because even though we think of feeling as receptive, receptivity is not the same thing as passivity. And passivity in this context is uh, a relationship in which one is not acting at all. So if you take two people, so this is the analogy I want to use. One person initiates a hug and the other person receives the hug. If you've ever had the experience of initiating a hug which is unreciprocated, you know that it's an awkward experience because half of the thing which makes the hug what it is, is not actually present. In order for a hug to be a hug, yes, there's someone who initiates it, but for in order for it to be what it is and to fulfill the social role that it's designed to fulfill, it has to be a mutual embrace. Someone has to actively respond in a receptive fashion. By the same token, feeling something, uh, you put a rock in someone's hand, it's not just that the rock is making itself manifest in relation to the person in a way that produces the sense of being touched. It's that the person has the energy the power, and these, these terms are coextensive with each other, the person has the energy and power of reaching out and embracing a thing in a way that receives the qualitative sense of being touched in a particular way. And so when you cut off circulation of the blood, uh, you know, say to the bottom half of your left arm, it's going to weaken or deaden both your ability to act actively, you know, to reach out and grab something, and to act receptively, to receive the uh, qualities that are inherent in particular created things in those kind of ontological categories, in the category of touch um, or whatever. So I want to go talk about one more thing in relationship to the blood. Actually, before I talk about that last thing, I do want to mention um, in the context of this communicative function, I want you to note in the sacrificial system the role that blood plays in opening up paths of communication throughout the creation. So the tabernacle and later the temple is a miniature world model. We've discussed this again and again um, in our uh, various talks. Uh, the tabernacle, is its design is dictated in seven speeches, which correspond conceptually with the seven creation days. The temple, its construction takes seven years. You find creation week patterns very, very commonly when you're dealing in terms of the sanctuary. So what's going on in the various liturgical actions in these sanctuaries is the commemoration of past divine acts, which made the world what it is, and active perpetuations of certain qualities which the world ought to be, or which the world is becoming. 
think about how theaters are often connected with sanctuaries in Hellenistic and other cultures. Why is it that uh, that theaters have this connection with temples? Well, it's because after a fashion, a tabernacle or a temple is a stage on which key events in cosmic history are reenacted. Every year you have what's called the year rite. This exists across many different cultures and the Israelite form is the Day of Atonement. But you have the year rite where essentially what's going on is the reenactment of the creation of the world. Why is the creation being reenacted, headed by a human being? It's because God has created the world in, uh, in such a way that it is co-constituted with mankind. He didn't have to create it that way. He has the power in himself to sustain it all by himself, but he has freely brought man into that relationship such that man's liturgical reenactment of the creation is essential for the perpetuation of its existence. It's a common theme throughout world cultures, the idea that sacrifice and liturgy is actually an instrument by which the world is perpetuated in its existence. Think about what goes on in the flood. You have Seth replaces Abel, who is the head of the sacrificial system. He begins to call on the name of the Lord, which is a liturgical and a sacrificial phrase. But eventually, almost all the righteous Sethites are dead until there's only one family left and the world basically collapses in on itself. And the only reason that the world didn't completely cease to exist is because Noah consecrated this sanctuary, which we call the Ark, and then liturgically re-offered the whole world to God after the flood. So what does this have to do with blood? What it has to do with blood is the sprinkling of blood in the tabernacle in the Israelite sacrificial rituals occurs at points of contact. Okay, so uh, in the various offerings, you have blood, which is drawn out from the sacrificial animal, and then it's sprinkled on the altar or it is sprinkled at the altar of incense or the mercy seat. These points, in the tabernacle are crucial because they are mediating points. The altar is a miniature holy mountain. Okay, uh, You can actually see this in Ezekiel where it's called the mountain of God, but you can see it in many other ways. The ascension offering, that's Leviticus chapter one often translated whole burnt offering, but literally the word Olah means ascension. It's the ascension offering as it reenacts Israel's approach to Sinai. Sinai is the mountain of God on which the glory of God descends. It's the connecting point between heaven as the dwelling place of God and earth where we are right now. And it allows for a communication of life and operation between these two realms of existence. Commerce is reestablished between heaven and earth. And commerce is reestablished because of the sanctification and the existence of the holy mountain. Now, this relationship does not cease when Israel physically departs from Mount Sinai. It is perpetuated through the tabernacle, which is a moving Mount Sinai, beginning with the altar itself. So you have blood which is sprinkled on the altar, and in terms of the liturgical reenactment of what happens in Passover, that's one of the things going on in the Ascension Offering. Blow by blow, you can match it to the specific events of the Passover. Uh, liturgically, uh, the sprinkling of blood on the altar corresponds to the sprinkling of blood on the Israelite doorposts when the angel of death passes through Egypt and spares the uh, children of Israel. Now, it's not exactly true to say that he spares the children of Israel so much as it is to say that he puts the whole of Egypt to death, including Israel, but in the morning, the Israelite children uh, firstborn are resurrected. There's a death and resurrection theme which is going on in the Paschal sacrifice, which of course is fulfilled in its fullness in the work of Christ. Blood is that which communicates activity from the world, and it gets that activity from God, into the human body, enabling the human body to move through the you know, activity of man, and blood opens up liturgical doors because uh, it allows for the communication of information, of qualities, of relationships through these doors. So what happens on the Day of Atonement? Well, the Day of Atonement has many dimensions to it, which we're not, all, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them today, of course, but it has many dimensions to it. Um, one of them is the reenactment of creation. Uh, and creation is constituted as a kind of uh, multi-leveled 
but single organism. So the creation is this, uh, this single organism where there are multiple levels of structure. And you can think of it in terms of the idea of the spheres, uh, the celestial spheres of Aristotelian cosmology, each of which bears a relationship to the others in terms of the outermost one moves the next one in and then that moves the next one in. But we shouldn't think of that in terms of a temporal relationship. It's like gears in a machine. One of them is moving the next one, but this is all happening at once. It's not a temporal next relationship. Uh, it's, it's a causal next relationship. And so the gears of creation are moving through the energy that God is at every moment communicating to it. But what happens in the fall is there's a rupture, not only between God and man, but between the internal structure of creation. So the most obvious rupture is the rupture between man and woman in Genesis 3. Uh, man says, well, it's not my fault, the woman whom you gave to me uh, uh, told me to eat the fruit. So there's a rupture with the woman and there's a rupture with God. God is the source of all of this energy. He's what allows for movement to exist in the first place. And God's pouring of life into the creation actually is mediated and realized among other things through human reproduction. Be fruitful and multiply. That's a way in which life in the image of God expands outwards and fills the cosmos. So there's a schism now between man and woman. There's a schism between man and God. There's a schism between man and the creation. The creation now acts as a mediator of curse to mankind. Creation rises up to rebel against its uh, uh, reckless overlord. Think about what happens after the murder of Abel. God says, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. Well, then what happens? Then you have a multiplication and an expansion of violence in all of the years leading up to the flood until the creation is so ticked off with man, creation actually rises up and consumes the entire human family except for one, uh, one single family, Noah, his three sons, and all of their wives, eight people. Uh, creation collapses in on itself. And that's not just a passive thing. It's not just because man is ceasing to uphold the creation actively, but the creation itself can be conceived of kind of mechanically. No, the creation is actually actively rising up against mankind in this way. Uh, so the creation as a whole is a multi-level structure where there are a network of relationships by which energy or activity or life is communicated in all directions. And of course, at the center of this is God. And the incarnation facilitates the perpetual existence of creation and glory because the logos is kind of the heart of God. It's the, it, the logos is the focal point of divine memory. We can talk about that in more detail another time. But with the incarnation, the heart of God becomes the heart of the world. And when the heart of the world is necessarily existent, as when the heart of the world is the existent one, there's no way to deconstruct the world anymore. The world's permanence has been guaranteed, and that concept, that brings about the end of sacrifice as the means by which the world is perpetuated, because there's this final sacrifice by which the existent one unites himself with every aspect of the world. But the sprinkling of blood at points of mediation between two levels of the creation makes sense in light of bloods being the communicator, the mediator, the instrument by which activity or life is transmitted from one aspect of the world to another aspect of the world. It seals things back together, which had been severed from each other by human sin. And one of the dimensions to the redemption of the cosmos is the sealing of everything back together, the unification of things with each other. Uh, in Christ, heaven and earth are sealed back together. In Christ, man and woman are reconciled. In Christ, Israel and the nations are reconciled. There are these degrees and kinds of reconciliation of unification and integration, which don't mean the reduction of one thing into another thing, but their harmonious coexistence. So there's an interesting book um, on, for on harmony as the central kind of concept of the medieval cosmos. Think about the harmony of the, uh, of the spheres. You have the celestial spheres, which are said to be creating this music, which is the backdrop for all reality. If you're not familiar with that concept, uh, 
that's fine. If you are familiar, I hope you can see the connection between that and what I'm saying. Uh, so the contemporary scientific study of the human body and the role that blood plays within what we now call the cardiovascular system has very deep connections with the biblical and the traditional symbolic grammar by which uh, we make sense of the world. And it has very deep connections with the role that blood plays within these traditional liturgical rituals. Finally, I want to talk about uh, the relationship of blood and bone. Um, blood is produced by the bone marrow, and bone marrow obviously exists within your bones. Now this is a very interesting point because the life of the flesh is in the blood. What you are at bottom, your selfhood, is continually constituted by your existence as a living being, as a living reality, as an organism which is animated by life. And the corporeal or bodily correspondent to that life is blood, which is produced from within your bones. Now, why is that at all interesting? It's because bone in the Hebrew language, at least, I'm not sure if there are multiple words for it, but at least in the uh, word that's used in Genesis 2, bone means self. So Adam says, this truly is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Well, literally, this is, this truly is self of myself and flesh of my flesh. So God takes Adam, he divides him in two, and then he reunites him in glory without reducing the second half back into the first. There's an expansion of communion because now there are two distinct subjects of communion which are united together in a glorious way which advances humanity as the image and likeness of God. Adam then says, she shall be called woman, Isha, for she was taken out of man, Ish. Well, Ish here, regardless of whether you think it has an etymological connection, that doesn't actually matter all that much. Uh, it functions as a pun with the Hebrew word esh or fire. And if you want to see the demonstration for that in the text of Genesis, go to Genesis 15, which is the only other place in the book that you see the word for deep sleep that's used in Genesis 2. And what do you know? You have a division of sacrificial animals in two, and then you have divine fire passing between those two parts, ish and ash. In the beginning of 2 Kings, you have, uh, the, you have King Ahab sending messengers to Elisha and saying, man of God, come down. That's, uh, Ish of God, come down, and then fire falls from heaven. Esh of God, come down. There's a pun which exists in biblical theology, and that pun undergirds and reflects a conceptual connection between the two. Uh, man started out as dust, well, then he's divided in two and reunited in male and female in a harmonious relationship, and then he's Ish and Isha, fire and fireess. So the dust becomes glorious, it is made fire part of the process by which mankind is glorified and is brought from the image of God to the likeness of God. Uh, so bones signify the essential selfhood of a person. You have human nature, and human nature is individuated concretely in terms of human hypostases, human persons. Human nature can never exist abstractly. It only and always exists in concrete, particular, personal realizations. And the fact that blood is produced within that very structure which constitutes an individual person as in the bodily, in the corporeal sense, an instance of that nature, I think is remarkable because you have this connection between two concepts in biblical theology and it just so happens that you have a corresponding connection in the active structure of the human body, a connection which really uh, was only empirically confirmable until with the rise of you know, modern biological science, with the rise of these kinds of study of organic human biological existence. Uh, I think there was one more thing I wanted to say on this. I'm trying to, I don't want to miss, uh, oh yes, the, the one other thing I wanted to say on bones, this doesn't have to do with blood, uh, I don't think it does, maybe, it maybe does in some respect, but it's not within that primary category, but I think this explains theologically why it's important that Christ's bones not be broken, okay? So in the New Testament, you have an emphasis on the fact that the Lamb of God, when he's crucified, has no broken bones. 
And you can say, yes, it's a typological connection with the Passover lamb. And that's, of course, true. It's a typological connection with various things that are said about the righteous man in the Psalms. Not one of his bones should be broken. But nothing is merely a typological resonance. Every typological connection always is undergirded and undergirded by and founded upon a qualitative, symbolic connection. Just like nothing is merely typological in the advancement of biblical history, everything that is typological simultaneously serves to concretely advance the purpose of God in the world. You know, nothing is a poetic kind of gloss which has no other purpose than to be poetic. Poetry, rather, is the inner structure and grammar of reality such that everything uh, every act whereby God advances his purpose in the world necessarily appears in a musical, poetic, glorious form. Um, but the, uh, since the individual kind of essence or particular structure of the human being, the human person, is corporeally and bodily signified by the skeleton, it's kind of like the, the, uh, the blueprint on which kind of everything else is built upon that. Right, uh, You have a, a basic structure, you build the walls and everything, and then you fill it up with various things. So that's kind of the analogy that the skeleton has with respect to the whole body. And the redemptive work of Christ has its effectiveness because he was utterly undivided in his incarnate state. So the purpose of Christ in the incarnation and economy of redemption the purpose of Christ was to reunify everything, and not only to reunify that which had been broken, but bring it to an even higher degree of unity than had existed prior to the fall. That's why that some of the fathers teach that the incarnation would have occurred even apart from the fall, and I happen to agree with them. Um, but the incarnation serves both to redeem and to glorify. The principal plot of biblical history is not redemption from sin, it's the glorification of the world from childhood to uh, maturity. The principal subplot is redemption from sin, because redemption from sin has to be accomplished in order to bring about the original purpose, which is the glorification of the world. Now, what the devil was doing throughout the history of the Old Covenant is he was attempting to prevent and obstruct the realization of the divine purpose to glorify all things in this perfect perfect divine unity by shattering things into little bits right so he would divide man against man and the conflict between the two would shatter things even further man against man man against god creation against man etc etc and these conflicts as they progressed would shatter things into smaller and smaller bits and the smaller things got thinking in terms of this image, the smaller things got, the sharper they got, the more dangerous they got to other things. The worse somebody gets, the more dangerous they are to everyone around them and to the creation. And so the creation is being shattered into smaller and smaller and smaller bits uh, as God is maturing one particular seed line. So, you know, remember how Jesus says the wheat or the, uh, the wheat and the tares, they, they grow together. Okay, so the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman march alongside each other. So I'm just focusing on one aspect of this plot. Things are being shattered into smaller and smaller and smaller bits. And then the Messiah comes, and this is the climactic event of the devil's kind of overarching program. Now he is going to destroy the Messiah by casting all of the shattered little pieces of the creation and of the human family at him. The greatest act of evil which had ever been committed, he now facilitates. The devil enters into Judas in order to bring about the crucifixion, in order to bring about the murder of Jesus. Everything in the devil's program has been working towards this moment. The seed of the woman is promised immediately after the fall, and so now he completes his program by destroying the Messiah with the very dangerous tiny little shards of broken glass which are the ruptured, in the internally severed creation. But the thing is, Jesus, being a divine person, a secret concealed from the devil, Jesus being a divine person, bound to human nature in his divine personhood. See my video on the unity of Christ's person, if you want more details on the Christological significance of all of this. Jesus being a divine person is inseparable from that to which he is bound, because he is the archetype after which the creation is made. When the creation is joined to him, it fits perfectly as it were. It fits so perfectly that you can't pull them apart. And 
What happens when all of the little broken shards of creation are directed to be joined to Christ's body? Well, the only thing that can happen is the paradoxical unshattering of the glass. And this is how his whole program backfired on him. Uh, and you, you can see the Lex Talionis, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The serpent deceives the woman. There's a deception that he foists on mankind. So God foists a great deception on the serpent. With the crafty, he is crafty, I think in the Psalms it says. Um, and so his whole plan backfires because what was meant to cut the Messiah to little bits ends up uncutting the shards of broken, created glass. And that is why it is so important that no bones on Christ be broken, because that signifies and realizes in bodily form the essential unity of Christ as an incarnate divine hypostasis. Okay, so uh, that is all we have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you enjoyed the video, uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share with those who you might think are interested. And of course, I wanted to say thank you so much to everybody who has contributed on Patreon. I've really been um, uh, surprised in a good way by the response that it's received. And thank you, everybody who watches in general. I really do appreciate it. Have a good one.